So what I'm going to talk is on the carotid body chemo reflex. As a physiologist, when I started my career, my master's thesis and subsequently my PhD thesis was on the visceral reflexes. So in the process, <clears throat> I, in a way, I grew up with Dr. Bob Daly's and Jennifer Angel James, their contributions to the understanding of the reflex. And when I entered into the field of carotid body, I realized <clears throat> Professor Daly was one of the first one back in 1950s who reported that carotid body receives the highest blood flow, and which is a sort of a very seminal contribution to the field of chemoreceptors. I had the privilege of meeting Professor Daly in a symposium that was um, conducted by Professor Trepsky back in 1989. This is Professor Daly. And when I saw him, I was really thrilled and introduced to myself. I just started my career at that time. And he told me that he retired, and uh, he was sort of having a laboratory in Professor Spire's department in London. And <clears throat> this, was, this was me, and this was Mike Spire, and this is Professor Daly. So in fact, I had the privilege of meeting him once in my lifetime. And <clears throat> what I'm going to talk today is uh, the blood pressure regulation in sleep apnea. So what is sleep apnea? <clears throat> sleep apnea is a respiratory disease characterized by periodic cessation of breathing during sleep. And this apneas can be either due to the obstruction of the upper airway, or it could be the defective rhythm generation by the central respiratory neurons, which is also called a central apnea. It is not a trivial disease. In fact, the recent study shows as much as 10% of the population, adult population, are prone to this sleep apnea syndrome. Here is an example of a person having the obstructive sleep apnea. As you can see that during the obstruction of the upper airway, there is no airflow, although the central rhythm continues. As a consequence of the obstruction of the uh, cessation of the airflow, arterial blood saturation drops. Here the person wakes up, saturation improves. Once again, he goes into the apnea and saturation drops. So in other words, this periodic cessation of breathing is reflected in chronic intermittent hypoxia. Either it is obstruction or central. So the chronic intermittent hypoxia is the hallmark manifestation of the sleep apnea syndrome. Why is it so important that we need to worry about the sleep apnea? The major problem with the sleep apnea is the control of blood pressure or the dysregulation of the blood pressure. Biren Sommers and Frank Abood <clears throat> back in 1995 reported that the obstructive sleep apnea patients have a very high sympathetic nerve activity. And during the episodes of apnea, look at the blood pressure, how much it goes. It goes to systolic as much as 256. It is like giving a bolus injection of catecholamines into the bloodstream. And in addition to that, they also have high resting blood pressure, that is hypertension. And this spikes in the blood pressure during the apneas, that can predispose the people to the hemorrhagic stroke if the capillaries gets burst. And then that's how the prevalence of the mortality seems to be very high during the sleep. And it could conceivably, due to the, this marked increase in the blood pressures, predisposing them to hemorrhagic stroke. And the high blood pressure, if it is a chronic one, it can also lead to the heart failure. Most of these people, they are sort of resistant to the conventional hypertension therapies. So in other words, they are resistant to these drugs 
as a consequence, controlling the blood pressure is a major problem in these people. How does sleep apnea cause this hypertension of the dysregulated blood pressure? As we know that this uh, periodic desaturations of the intermittent hypoxia is sensed by the carotid body tumor receptors, and during each drop in the arterial blood saturation, chemo receptor activity goes up, and this sensory information is transmitted to the brainstem neurons, particularly in the nucleus tractus solitarius and rostroventrolateral medulla, which is the premotor pre sympathetic neurons, and leads to an increase in sympathetic activity and blood pressure. Supporting such a possibility is the finding that the sleep apnea patients indeed do have high chemoreceptor gain, as evidenced by heightened ventilator response and as well as the sympathetic nerve response to hypoxia. And more interestingly, some, quite some time back in 1960s, people start, uh, were removing the carotid bodies thinking it was a cure for asthma. Nothing much happened to the asthma. But some of these people did develop the sleep apneas, but they do not have it, their hypertension phenotype. That is one of the first clues that I came to know that indeed the carotid body chemoreflex seems to be very critical for driving this blood pressure phenotype. Obviously, we cannot study the mechanisms in the human subjects. And that necessitated to develop a rodent model of sleep apnea, particularly mimicking the oxygen saturation profiles. And <clears throat> this was first done by Gene Fletcher back in the late 1980s, actually. And he gave the rodents, the rats, to an blood oxygen, an intermittent hypoxia, simulating the oxygenation in the sleep apnea people. In our experiments, we gave 5% inspired oxygen for 15 seconds. We chose the 15 seconds because there's an average ethnic duration in an adult human being. Followed by five minutes of room air, nine episodes per hour, eight hours per day, and during 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., which is the sleep time for the rodents. And here is an example of the oxygen saturation in the monitor for about eight hours. You can see the saturation during each episode of hypoxia. It drops by about 97 to 80%, which is very similar to what we see in the human subjects. And these animals, the rodents that are exposed to 10 days of intermittent hypoxia, do have a high resting blood pressure high sympathetic nerve activity. And during the simulated apneas, you can see a marked increase in the blood pressures. And by ablating the carotid body selectively, you no longer see the blood pressure is normalized here, and you no longer see these blood pressure spikes during the simulated apneas. So these studies really establish that <coughs> the rodent model of CAH recapitulates the blood pressure phenotype seen in the sleep apnea patients, and also suggests that the carotid body chemoreflex mediates the blood pressure response to CAH. And this prompted us to look <clears throat> what exactly is happening to the carotid body. This is the control animal. We recorded the carotid body chemoreceptor activity and this is the integrated activity. You can see during the simulated apneas in the control animal, there is always an increase in the carotid body sensory activity, which promptly returns back after, uh, after stopping the stimulus. This is the <coughs> carotid bodies from the rats that are exposed to 10 days of intermittent hypoxia. You can see that, first of all, the hypoxic sensitivity is markedly augmented. More remarkably, after stopping these simulated apneas, look at the carotid body activity. It goes on progressively increases, and it stays up 
almost for about four or five hours. This long-lasting increase in the carotid body activity we call sensory long-term facilitation. So the take-home message is that the animals that are exposed to intermittent hypoxia, simulating the oxygen saturation profiles in the sleep apnea patients, leads to the sensitization of the carotid body response to acute hypoxia and induces the form of plasticity called sensory long-term facilitation. And these effects, you do not see it with one day exposure to intermittent hypoxia. You need to have exposing them consecutively for about several days. And the intensity of hypoxia used for the IH condition has no impact on the carotid body response to CAH. And intermittent hypoxia had a very negligible or no effect on the carotid body morphology, suggesting that the stimulus is somehow affecting the chemoreceptor tissue itself. What could be the physiological consequences of this altered carotid body function? This augmented hypoxic response could conceivably be uh, contributing to the marked increase in sympathetic nerve activity and increase in the blood pressures during the apneic episodes. Whereas the sensory long-term facilitation, that means heightened carotid body chemoreceptor activity, could be reflexly driving the sympathetic zone during the daytime where there are no apneas and also contributing to the elevated resting blood pressures. What could be the cellular mechanisms underlying the effects of CAH on the carotid body? <clears throat> this intermittent hypoxia is interspersed with the periods of reoxygenation. And we thought that during this reoxygenation phase, there could be an increase in the reactive oxygen species. And they could be contributing to the heightened chemo reflux of the carotid body activity. If this hypothesis is right, then one should see an increase in the reactive oxygen species levels by in the carotid bodies of intermittent hypoxia exposed rats. Second, raw scavengers should prevent the effects of CAH on the carotid body. And the third, exogenous administration of the ROS should mimic the effects of intermittent hypoxia even in the controlled carotid bodies. Indeed, if we monitored the melandehyde levels as an index of the reactive oxygen species, you can see one day has a negligible effect, three days has marked increase, 10 days there is a, almost about two or three-fold increase in the reactive oxygen species levels. If you treat every day these rats before subjecting them to the intermittent hypoxia with a raw scavenger, membrane permeable raw scavenger, the effect of CAH on the carotid body is completely blocked. There is no sensitization of the hypoxic response, nor was there any induction of sensory long-term facilitation. So we could demonstrate that the two criteria that is important for establishing the role of the ROS is satisfied with these experiments. How about the third one? <clears throat> this is a sort of periodic hypoxia we gave to the control carotid bodies. There is a small increase in sensory nerve activity, and there is no long-term facilitation. Then we superfuse them with hydrogen peroxide as little as 500 nanomolar for about 60 minutes. By itself, it had no effect. Whereas after the hydrogen peroxide one, if you give the same periodic hypoxia, you see a marked increase in sensory nerve activity. And there is a robust induction of the sensory long-term facilitation. And these studies suggest that, indeed, ROS can mimic the effects of intermittent hypoxia on the controlled carotid bodies. In other words, what this data is showing us, this very brief episodes of intermittent hypoxia is recruiting 
the reactive oxygen species and amplifying the signals leading to the cellular response. That's the uh, sort of, we interpreted the data in this way. And where are the ROS coming from? The sources of ROS. We know that pro-oxidant enzymes generate the reactive oxygen species, and they get degraded by the antioxidant enzymes. The balance between the pro and antioxidant enzymes is the determinant of the cellular redox state. So we went and measured the pro-oxidants. Here in this example, I'm showing uh, NADPH oxidases NOx2 and NOx4 isoforms. There is a robust induction of NOx2 and to some extent NOx4. But in the same carotid bodies, the antioxidant here, I show the example of superoxide dismutase, is an ant antioxidant enzyme. This is markedly downregulated. So what it is showing is that the CIH facilitates the transcription of the prooxidant enzymes, whereas it depresses the antioxidant enzymes. As a consequence, you have an increase in the ROS generation. As I said that, <clears throat> there is a marked increase in the prooxidant enzyme transcription genes that are encoding the prooxidant enzymes, whereas the antioxidant enzyme genes are downregulated. So what molecular mechanisms could potentially be contributing to this? As I said this, the effects of intermittent hypoxia is a time-dependent process. It doesn't happen within a one-day exposure to intermittent hypoxia for eight hours. It requires minimum three days and full-blown response after 10 days. This time-dependent activity usually ascribed to recruitment of transcription factors, which can potentially contribute to the transcription regulation of pro- and antioxidant enzymes and their respective protein expression and enzyme activity leading to the ROS. Now we know there are several transcription factors that can be activated by intermittent hypoxia. But for the today's talk, I'm going to focus upon hypoxia inducible factor transcription fa activators. The hypoxia inducible factors, these are the transcription activators. The first one was described back in 1992 by Greg Semenza, the HIF-1. And subsequently, Steve McKnight discovered the HIF-2 or the hypoxia inducible factor 2. These transcription factors, both HIF-1 and HIF-2, have an alpha subunit, which is very sensitive to oxygen levels. Under the normoxic conditions, the alpha subunit is very, has a very little protein in the cells. In response to hypoxia, the protein accumulates because of decreased degradation, ubiquitin-mediated degradation, by inhibiting the enzyme proline hydroxylases, which were discovered by Peter Radcliffe. Once if the hypoxia, these alpha subunits are accumulated, they bind with the constitutively expressed beta subunit, and the complex gets uh, <clears throat> driven to the nucleus and initiates the transcription by binding to the DNA with the HRE hypoxic responsive element uh, motifs. The HIF-1 and HIF-2, the alpha subunits uh, have a sort of almost about 48 to 50% sequence homology. They're very similar. What we found, if we expose, these are the experiments done initially on the rat pheochromocytoma cells, PC12 cells. If you take the split the cells into two, and one we exposed to continuous hypoxia for about six hours, you can see that both HIF1 and HIF2 protein goes up markedly. The same cells, if you split and expose them to intermittent hypoxia with the same paradigm what I alluded before, 15 to 30 seconds of hypoxia followed by five minutes normoxia, you give 60 cycles. See that HIF1 goes up markedly and HIF2 completely disappears almost. So in other words, you are changing the balance, intermittent hypoxia, between the HIF1 and HIF2. 
Subsequently, we could, in the same paper, we could also show that it can happen even in the intact animals in various tissues too, including the carotid body. And how this mechanism is that IH activates uh, the IP3 receptors as well as the phospholipid C gamma, eventually leading to increase in cytosolic calcium. And the calcium on one hand stimulates through the PKC pathway, mammalian target of rapamycin, leading to the activation of S6 kinase and increases the HIF1 alpha protein synthesis. And that explains why the HIF1 alpha protein levels goes up with IH. You can block that either by blocking the mTOR or even blocking the calcium. At the same time, the calcium is also activating the calcium-dependent protease calpanes, and calpanes choose up or the, degrades the HIF2-alpha protein. We could, in the recent paper, we could identify the calpane binding sites, both at the N-terminus and the C-terminus of the HIF2-alpha. So the bottom line here is that IH increases the calcium which on one hand leads to an increase in HIF1 alpha protein synthesis, whereas at the same time degrades the HIF2 alpha protein. And as a consequence, you change the balance between the HIF1 and HIF2. Once if the HIF1 is getting activated, it transcriptionally regulates, upregulates the prooxidant enzymes, NOX2 and NOX4. At the same time, the HIF2 decrease in the protein leads to insufficient transcription of the antioxidant enzymes, particularly the SOT2 catalase, uh, at least six of the antioxidant enzymes, we could show that. As a consequence of that, you get an increase in the ROS, and that contributes to the carotid body activity. If you take a partially mice with partial deficiency of HIF1 alpha, hypox intermittent hypoxia no longer increases the ROS levels, nor does it cause an increase in the augmented carotid body activity, nor the hypertension. On the other hand, if you take a mice with a partial deficiency of the HIF2 alpha, have all the phenotype of the mice that are exposed to intermittent hypoxia. They have a high number of apneas, they have a high blood pressures, and their carotid body activity is very high. So thus far, we could show that the intermittent hypoxia effects are mediated by the ROS signaling, and the transcriptional mechanism that contributes to the ROS is mainly through the imbalanced expression of HIF1 and HIF2 alpha transcriptional activators. How does the ROS affect the carotid body activity? <clears throat> there are several theories that are proposed to explain how the carotid body is exquisitely sensitive to changes in the oxygen levels in the blood, which I had the privilege of uh, uh, reviewing that for comprehensive physiology with uh, Prem Kumar. But the current understanding from our lab is based on findings that the gloma cells of the carotid body expresses two enzymes. One is the hemoxygenase 2, which catalyzes the formation of endogenous carbon monoxide. Another enzyme is the cystathenin gamma lyase, which catalyzes the formation of hydrogen sulfide. Under the normoxic conditions, the hemoxygenase 2 activity is very high, and that causes an high levels of SIBO in the cell, in the carotid body which in turn inhibits the CAC activity and less H2S production, leading to the opening of the potassium channels and closure of the calcium, eventually less transmitter release and low sensory activity. Whereas during hypoxia, hypoxia inactivates the hemoxygenase 2. Particularly, we could identify two cysteine residues in the heme regulatory motif that are extremely sensitive to oxygen levels. And as a consequence of inhibition of the hemoxygenase 2, you have a less production of carbon monoxide. You no longer inhibit the CAC. CAC gets activated. Very high levels of H2S, which can lead to the closure of the potassium channels and opening of the calcium channels, leading to high transmitter release. So in other words, in this scenario, <clears throat> 
heme oxygenase functions as an oxygen sensor in the carotid body, whereas the H2S is the effector molecule, and H2S mediates the sensory excitation of the carotid body during hypoxia. Therefore, we tested whether the CAH increases the H2S abundance in the carotid body, and whether the H2S contributes to the enhanced carotid body activity by intermittent hypoxia. So we just recently measured the H2S levels in the controlled carotid bodies and from the carotid bodies of the rats that are exposed to 10 days of intermittent hypoxia with and without the Ross scavenger. You can see that intermittent hypoxia exposed carotid bodies exhibit high levels of H2S and the Ross scavenger completely prevents this phenotype. And this paper is coming in the August 16th issue of the Science Signaling. And we monitored the carotid body activity by treating the rats with a pharmacological inhibitor of the CAC, which inhibits the H2S synthesis. These are the control carotid bodies and these are the carotid bodies exposed to intermittent hypoxia. You can see potentiation of the hypoxic response and long-term facilitation. And if you treat the animals with L-propargyl glycine, which is a very selective inhibitor of the cystathenin gamma lyase, CAH no longer augments the carotid body response and the induction of sensory long-term facilitation is completely blocked. Same way, if you take the mice that are genetically absent of the CAC, the wild-type mice shows the response to CAH with an augmented sensitivity and long-term facilitation, whereas CAC null mice, CAH no longer potentiates the hypoxic sensitivity, nor does it induce uh, the long-term facilitation. So these study studies suggest that the ROS-dependent ROS -dependent H2S generation mediates the augmented carotid body activity by uh, chronic intermittent hypoxia. The carotid body afferent activity is transmitted to the nucleus tractus solitarius. From there, it goes to the rostroventrolateral medulla and increases the sympathetic output and affects the end organ response, for example, adrenal medulla. Does the CAH affects also affects the NTS and RVLM as well as the sympathetic end organ that is adrenal medulla? These experiments we reported two years back, and these are the slices where we punched the areas of the NTS and RVLM, and we took this small punch as a control area and monitored the MDA levels, and after the exposure to intermittent hypoxia, there is no change in the ROS levels in the control area, whereas the NTS and RVLM shows a robust increase in the reactive oxygen species. And we used another assay in the adrenal medulla, a conitase enzyme. This enzyme has iron sulfur clusters, and it is there in the citric acid cycle. You can monitor both the cytosolic and mitochondrial fractions in the conitase enzyme activity. Whenever there is an increase in the <coughs> reactive oxygen species, it inhibits the conitase enzyme activity. So inhibition of the enzyme activity is a good reflection of increased ROS. So we monitored both in the cytosolic and mitochondrial fractions. As you can see that both fractions, the conitase enzyme activity goes down following the chronic intermittent hypoxia, suggesting an increased reactive oxygen species. And these effects of increased ROS is also associated with an increased expression of HIF1 alpha and decreased expression of HIF2 alpha and upregulation of the prooxidant enzyme genes and downregulation of antioxidant enzyme genes. If you repeat these experiments in carotid body ablated rats, CAH no longer increases ROS levels are the changes in the <coughs> HIF in the NTS and RVLM as well as adrenal medulla, suggesting that chemoreceptor input is necessary to induce the changes in the central nervous system 
and in the effect of argon like adenine metal. Now, this prompts us, since the carotid body is driving, is that as a therapeutic target that we can affect the blood pressure changes by uh, targeting the carotid body? So in 2014, we reported that we cryocoagulated the carotid bodies. That means just put a drop of liquid nitrogen on that. And after about two to three weeks, if you do the histology, there is no evidence of the glomus cells being monitored by uh, immunocytochemistry with the tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the marker of the glomus cells, which are completely absent. And these animals do have an intact carotid barrel reflex. So we selectively could ablate the carotid bodies. And by doing so, uh, if the carotid body ablated animals, CAH no longer increased the basal blood pressure, as well as during the simulated apnea as the blood pressure spikes. So in other words, these experiments provided a sort of proof of the concept that the carotid bodies can be targeted uh, to prevent the blood pressure changes caused by intermittent hypoxia. So what is the problem with that? As I told you that some time back, they removed the carotid bodies in the human subjects, and when they developed the sleep apnea syndrome, they no longer exhibited. But I was told by the group that studied a lot, those experiments were uh, <clears throat> studied by uh, Professor Honda with John Saveringhaus, as well as Brian Bipp in California. I was told some of these patients died during sleep. So in other words, their arousal probably is completely interrupted by the carotid body ablation. So in other words, that is not a real therapeutic strategy. Also, these people cannot do any exercise. I mean, there are a lot of other complications that cannot adapt to the high altitude. So instead of cutting the carotid bodies, can we bring down the sensitivity of the carotid body to the normal one? And that we can, since now we know the H2S synthesis inhibitor is preventing the phenotype on the carotid body, then if you treat the animals after the onset of hypertension, but the sleep apnea, if you treat them with an inhibitor, H2S synthesis inhibitor, can we bring it back? So that's what we did here. This is the control uh, animal. Uh, these are the blood pressure responses during the simulated apneas as well as the basal one. This is the splanchnic sympathetic nerve activity. After the 10 days of intermittent hypoxia, there is an increase in the baseline blood pressure and during the simulated apnea, as you can see, marked increase in blood pressures as much as 200, and robust activation of the sympathetic nerve activity. After the development of the 10 days, we gave it additional two days, the L-propargyl glycine, which inhibits the carotid body sensitization by CAH. You can see that the basal blood pressure came back. Splank no longer there is an increase in sympathetic nerve activity. And this, during the simulated apneas, no longer you see the blood pressure spikes. And this is the data that is coming out in August 16th paper in Science Signaling. So in other words, the point here I want to make is that, yes, therapeutic strategies, if you pharmacologically bring down the hypersensitivity of the carotid body, you can control the blood pressures. Finally, last few minutes of my talk, I want to devote whether these responses, blood pressure response to CAH, are they reversible? So what do we need to bother about it? For obstructive sleep apnea, continuous positive airway pressure is the treatment of choice. And treatment choice for the central apnea are very, very limited. But some subset of the obstructive sleep apnea patients, they do not respond to the CPAP treatment. Their blood pressures are not controlled. Still, they have a lot of apneas. So why is that these people are resistant to the CPAP therapy? Is it possible when the person is having undiagnosed sleep apnea, 
as a consequence exposed to very long time to the intermittent hypoxia. Maybe in these people, CPAP is not effective. That's a possibility. So we wanted to test that experimentally. So in one set of animals, we exposed them to short-term intermittent hypoxia. That means 10 days of intermittent hypoxia. Then we left them for 10 days recovery in the room air. As a consequence of intermittent hypoxia, there is an increase in the blood pressure and an increase in the carotid body sensory nerve activity and plasma catecholamine levels. These two served as the, uh, a reflection of the CB chemoreflex and the ROS levels are elevated. All the phenotype completely reversed after the 10 days recovery in the room air. In sharp contrast, if you expose the animals to 30 days of intermittent hypoxia and leave them for 30 days in the room air, <clears throat> the blood pressures did not return back even after the 30 days of recovery in the room air, not the CB chemo reflex as evidenced by the sensory nerve activity and plasma norepinephrine levels. And there is a persistent increase in the ROS levels both in the carotid body, the afferent part of the CB chemoreflex, and the adrenal medulla, which is the efferent side of the chemoreflex. So what causes this persistent ROS? Why is it not coming back? So we monitored the antioxidant enzyme profiles, both in the carotid body and the adrenal medulla. Even after the 30 days, there is a marked suppression of all the six antioxidant enzymes which we studied. So in other words, there is a persistent transcriptional downregulation that is induced by the long-term intermittent hypoxia, which is not reversed even after the 30 days of recovery in the room air. So what causes this uh, persistent downregulation of the gene transcription? We know now that there is epigenetic regulation can lead to persistent suppression of some of the genes through the DNA methylation, and to some extent by the histone modification. So these epigenetic changes are heritable cha modifications of the DNA, and they do not involve the changes in the DNA primary sequence. So we focused, is it possible that DNA hypermethylation may be induced in response to long-term IH? That leads to persistent downregulation of the antioxidant enzymes. And indeed, the genes that are completely downregulated showed a marked increase in the, this is methylated, we calculated the cytosine methylation. You can see marked increase in the DNA methylation of these. These enzymes that are not downregulated did not show any DNA methylation, whereas those enzymes that are downregulated transcriptionally showed a clear increase in the DNA methylation. The DNA methylation occurs at the CPG sites, which are called as the CPG islands. So we took the example of the superoxide dismutase as a model gene, and we looked, we made the different primers to look into the CPG regions at each site of them. As you can see that the site, what we call a CPG region one, which is away from the transcription site, has already constitutive expression of the increase in the DNA methylation. LT, uh, long-term intermittent hypoxia had no further effect. Whereas in this region, just before the transcription site, there are 25 CPG sites, and one of them is clearly showed a DNA hypermethylation. If you treat these animals with the desitabine, which is the DNA hypomethylating agents, which is commonly used in the cancer treatment, you can prevent all the DNA hypermethylation states as well as this particular hypomethylation, uh, hypermethylation caused by intermittent hypoxia. So, and this paper is just accepted. Hopefully, it is coming out in the next month uh, in the J Physiology. So, this data shows that DNA hypermethylation is induced by long-term intermittent hypoxia which leads to persistent downregulation of the antioxidant enzyme genes. As a consequence, you have a high levels of ROS and a persistent activation of the chemoreflex and blood pressures.
So if you treat these animals with a desitamine, either during the long-term intermittent hypoxia at, or during the recovery period with a desitamine, a bit alternate day, one milligram per kilogram, you completely reverse the keratotic body sensory nerve activity and the plasma norepinephrine levels, and you normalize the blood pressures. So in other words, this data taken together, what it suggests is that during the short-term intermittent hypoxia, you have a transcriptional regulation of the genes encoding the antioxidant enzymes to the HIP2 alpha, which leads to an increase in ROS levels, and all these responses are reversible following the reoxygenation or uh, recovery. Whereas the long-term intermittent hypoxia, we yet do not know the mechanism, activates the DNA methyl transferases, leads to the hypermethylation, DNA hypermethylation of antioxidant enzymes, and downregulation of the persistent downregulation of the antioxidant enzyme genes leads to the ROS levels. And this is an, not a reversible during the uh, recovery period, and eventually leading to persistent increase in chemosensory reflex and elevated blood pressures. So, <clears throat> in this talk, I try to summarize that controlling the blood pressure is a major problem in sleep apnea patients. And the dysregulated blood pressure is coming due to the heightened carotid body mediated chemoreflex. And ROS is a major cellular mechanism that contributes to the effect of intermittent hypoxia on the chemoreflex, which is trans under the short term intermittent hypoxia, it is controlled by the HIF transcription factors. Once if the ROS levels are increased in the carotid body, they recruit the H2S synthesis mechanism, and the increased H2S mediates the hyperactive carotid body. And finally, you can control the blood pressures by preventing the hypersensitivity to the carotid body with the pharmacological inhibitors of the H2S synthesis. Finally, if there is a long-term intermittent hypoxia, the effects are they recruit the DNA hypermethylation epigenetic phenomena, including the DNA hypermethylation, which leads to persistent ROS levels and irreversible changes in the blood pressure, which can be also be corrected by giving a DNA hypermethylating agents. So this work, I can talk, but the people who really contributed to this work is Dr. Kumar, who is a long-term collaborator of mine from the last 20, 30 years. Jane Anduri did all the epigenetic stuff. Dr. Pang was responsible for all the carotid body measurements. He has an extraordinary hand, even with the mice. His success rate is probably 80 to 90%. And Vlad Makarenko did all the glomus cell work. Dr. Goshan is the responsible for all the HIF stuff and the mitochondrial stuff, which I haven't had the time to show you today. And this is funded by two major grants. One is the program project grant. Another one is the CADET grant uh, by the NIH, a multi-million dollar grant to develop uh, the very potent H2S uh, synthesis inhibitors. And so that is in the third phase. Soon we'll be going for the FDA approval. And the talk what I gave you today is, in fact, uh, the, I wrote the review lecture based on my talk, and this article is available today in the experimental physiology, and that's what I have been told. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. <laughs>